One of the most interesting types of arguments about religion is the type which juxtaposes God's characteristics with the world around us, and challenges us to see how well the two fit together, either as proof of his existence or evidence against it. Today I'd like to talk about the latter group. If God is supposed to have trait X, why does the world have trait Y? If God is all-loving and all-powerful, then why is there suffering in the world? If God is all-powerful and wants everyone to have a filial relationship with him, then why doesn't everyone at least know that he exists? And if God is perfect in every way, well then why would he create anything in the first place? Now, of course, these questions are just the beginning of a discussion. There are many answers to these initial questions. But there's one answer in particular which I think is uniquely fascinating, and which is given to any and all of these questions. Well, God must have some unknown, mysterious reason for doing these things. Okay, but if no reasonable answer is forthcoming, and if God gave us our reasoning, and if we're made in his image, then wouldn't it be rational to conclude that there probably isn't a good reason if we can't think of one? Well, no, because God is incomprehensible, and thus we cannot make reasoned inferences about what God would or would not do. He's just that far beyond our understanding. You can't put God in a petri dish. This entire thought experiment is a fool's errand. It would be like a baby trying to understand why it's getting poked with a sharp needle by a strange man in a white coat. And, and I personally find offensive the idea that God's answers must be acceptable to us, lofty, holy humanity. So the first problem we have, I think, as not just Christians, but as thinking people is, what position are we in to judge the architecture of the universe? So my first question is, are we really in full possession of adequate facts to be able to say, hmm, we think God could have done better. Paul Draper notes, in order for a logical argument from evil to succeed, it is necessary to show that, for some known fact about evil, it is logically impossible for God to have a good moral reason to permit that fact to obtain. This, however, is precisely what most philosophers nowadays believe cannot be shown. And so the free will defense succeeds in showing it is at least logically possible for God to exist alongside evil. The first reason why I believe that God would allow suffering is because he has a greater purpose for it that we cannot see. Further, and I can't stress this enough, this argument is incredibly presumptuous, this argument from non-belief. It's just another way of saying, if the Christian God were real, he would do such and such. But this assumes knowledge of what God would do, and I fail to see how Scott is in the proper position to have such knowledge. I think what this argument is really saying is, if I were God, I would do such and such, but God doesn't do such and such, so God must not be real. In fact, this is roughly the answer that God himself gives toward the end of the book of Job. When Job asks God why these bad things are happening to me, God's response is, to paraphrase slightly, I don't have to tell you anything. You don't know me. Just accept that I have my reasons and shut the fuck. This is the answer I'd like to explore today. The idea that God must have some good reason we're just not aware of, and that God is mysterious in many ways, so it's foolish to even try to understand his reasons. As I see it, there are two major problems with this type of answer. Number one, while this does technically save God from being logically incompatible with the world around us, I think you need to ask yourself just how mysterious God's ways would have to be before you started asking questions either about his intentions or his capabilities. If, for example, you were one of the millions of Jews being gassed in Nazi Germany with no end in sight to Hitler's war machine, would you still insist that, well, God must have a good reason? I mean, what would it take for you to believe that, you know, maybe God couldn't have a good reason for doing this, that just doesn't seem compatible with the God I believe in. Maybe he's not in control of this. Or maybe... He's not even there. But what if you're someone who strongly believes the idea that God is just incomprehensible? It's not just that he has his reasons, and had he explained them to us, we would understand. It's that he could not explain his reasons because they're just incomprehensible to us. Well, the problem is, if God really is incomprehensible to us, 
then how can you actually know anything about God in the first place? If, for example, you believe that God is good, such that good things can be taken at face value, but bad things can happen for some unknown greater good, then couldn't it also be possible that good things actually happen for the greater evil, and bad things are just bad? Why not? If God truly is incomprehensible, then how do you actually know, for example, that God is good? Where and how do you actually draw the line between things we know about God and things that are incomprehensible about God? Well, it's true that God is fundamentally incomprehensible, but we can know things about him through the Bible. God isn't totally incomprehensible. We can know some things about him, like the fact that he is good, as the Bible says. This is why we interpret his actions as either good at face value or good in the long run. All right, same question, different terms. Couldn't the Bible's own statements about God be placed there by God for some incomprehensible reason whose ultimate purpose we don't understand? Even the notion that God doesn't lie could itself be a lie, again, for some incomprehensible reason that is beyond our understanding. You're a computer. I thought computers can't lie. They can if they are programmed to lie. Were you programmed to lie? No. God damn it. Side note about lying, I think it's worth pointing out that in the Bible, God apparently does send people a powerful delusion. So, that's something to think about. So, if God really is incomprehensible, and as a result, if we cannot understand his reasoning, well then it seems to me that God's very nature becomes unfalsifiable, and statements like, God is good, become meaningless. I mean, if God truly is incomprehensible, and if, as a result, he can do things that to us seem incompatible with his nature or his desires, then I don't see any particular reason to believe any particular thing about God, even if the Bible says so. But it gets even worse. Claiming that God is incomprehensible doesn't just seem to make his nature unfalsifiable, it seems to also make God's very existence unfalsifiable, and it actually undercuts other arguments that try to demonstrate that God exists because he is the best explanation for things around us. I mean, if you've ever pointed to something in our universe or our lives and explained just how amazingly compatible it is with the idea of God, whether it's morality, consciousness, life, whatever, but then you say that other things which don't seem compatible with God are just his mysterious reasons, well then the very idea of God becomes unfalsifiable, and your arguments for God become disingenuous. If your concept of God is compatible with literally anything, then all the evidence in the world for or against his existence, or for or against some facet of his nature, doesn't actually matter. Okay, so, so let me get your story straight. Uh, your mother was uh, on the brink of death, and then she was fine, right? Yep. And that's, and that's proof that God exists? Yes. Okay, what do you call it when a person is perfectly healthy and then drops dead? Is that proof that, it, that God does not exist? No, that's just proof that, that whatever happens to that person happens. Okay, so... Congratulations. You get the Caller of the Day Award for being honest and answering your own question. If your plan is to maintain, no matter what happens, that God must have a good reason for it, even if the event seems incompatible with his nature and desires, well then, anything that happens could conceivably be consistent with God, which has the effect of rendering the God explanation unfalsifiable, and ultimately trivial and silly, just like any other unfalsifiable claim. How did we manage to survive? What gave us those strange powers? Maybe we're all wearing magic rings, but they're invisible rings, so we don't even realize it. Also, you can't feel the rings. The second problem with the idea that God is incomprehensible, and that we therefore cannot psychoanalyze him or otherwise put him in a petri dish, is that, it turns out, many Christians routinely do exactly this, in order to defend God against accusations that he seems incompatible with the world around us. What they'll do in these situations is they'll look at the world around us, noticing that it doesn't quite fit with their conception of God, and then to solve this apparent conflict, they will essentially back-calculate God's nature or his intentions from that point using reason and inference. 
But then, in some cases, those same Christians will refuse their detractors the same liberty. For example, on the topic of why God would create anything if he's a perfect being, Christians will observe that, in fact, non-God things exist, and to explain this, they will essentially expand the definition of God's goodness in order to conclude that, yeah, surely he would create things like intelligent beings like humans, even though this is clearly going beyond what the Bible actually says. The kind of formally how you get the um, improbability under chance, then the imp um, of this uh, life permitting universe occurring, then how you get the imp uh, probability under theism, um, and you can't exact, get an exact probability, is you appeal to God's goodness. That's the real, that's what's underlying it. You perceive there's some value in, in body conscious agents. And since God is perfectly good, a perfectly good being, um, its motivation for acting in one way over another is whether acting in one way is better than acting in another. So it's the perfectly good being is m motivated by creating things that realize value. And so if you perceive a value in their being embodied conscious beings, then that's going to give God, you're going to think God is going to have a good reason to create such beings because God creates in accordance with, um, with value. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you God? Yeah, I didn't think so. So stop making inferences about what God would or would not do. Likewise, on the topic of why God would give us free will if it causes so much suffering, Christians will sometimes answer by saying, well, think about it. Would you be happy if someone loved you deterministically? Of course not. So God wouldn't be happy with that either. As we discussed in our video on the problem of evil, God wants free creatures to earnestly seek him because they want to. He doesn't want a world of Stepford wives or Pleasantville humans following a script. That in order to make beings that have the capacity to love, they must have the capacity to hate. If you're going to have the capacity to say yes, you must have the capacity to say no. And you say, well, why did God do that? Why do you have children? Never forget holding my first child in my arms. And realizing that I have brought this little girl into the world. She could grow up to say no to me. Why take the risk? Do you ever think about it? Why do we do it, ladies and gentlemen? Because we realize that granted the risk, the benefits outweigh the risk. To live in a world where love is possible, we all crave for a world in which love is actualized. And you hope one day, maybe you've already got there, you students at Rice, that you'll meet somebody and fall in love with them and they'll fall in love with you and they'll value you and they'll choose you. And the value of that, and you know that it's got an inherent risk. God took a risk to make a universe. I'm sorry, but where in the Bible does it actually say that God wouldn't be happy with this kind of deterministic, pre-programmed love? It doesn't. You're just projecting your own feelings onto God, saying, If I were God, I wouldn't want this kind of pre-programmed love. My feelings are real. I know. But you can't make someone love you. Can't I? On the topic of slavery in the Bible, Christians, and Jews named Ben Shapiro, will argue that God created these laws because, well, that must have been the best he could do at the time. Did God actually say this anywhere? No, of course not. We're just having to infer that this must have been his reason. There's no place in the Bible uh, where you can get a, a truly compelling case against slavery because the creator of the universe clearly expected slavery to be a human institution. Well, except for abolitionists finding enough inspiration in the Bible they, to use they it did as their main despite, text. Yeah, but they, dis they did that despite what's in the Bible. Well, I think, I think that that is, I mean, I, I, 
I don't want to, this, this shouldn't sound insulting because it's not meant as an insult. I think that from a religious point of view, that's an, ins, that's, that's a simplistic reading of the Bible's role in, in human affairs, meaning that when any written document is given to any group of people, it has to be given to people in a way that they can understand. It's not that slavery was endorsed by the Bible. It's that slavery is universal among human civilization until it, modern it, times. But it was, no, no. It, it, Let's pretend that you thought that God existed and that you, and that you were he. Uh, and it was and it was your job to convey to a group of human beings what you think morality should be, understanding that they're going to take that and develop that because we do have this gift of human reason that we use to develop things. There are some practices that were common in antiquity, like polygamy, uh, divorce, slavery would be another one, that the Bible as a whole makes clear this is not God's ideal mm -hmm. for human beings. But there are certain circumstances where God will accommodate his instruction to that circumstance and give instruction about how to function in relation to that institution at a particular time in history. And I used to think that that was kind of a cop-out to say that. But as I've thought about that, I've thought, you know, it's really not fair to expect that if God gives revelation at a particular time in history, that he's going to abolish all societal evil before he gives instruction to people who are living under fallen structures and fallen systems. So some of these laws in the Old Testament or in the New Testament epistles, like Ephesians 6, 5, for example, I think they give you more picture of day-to-day -day life as a Christian living in that context than what actually the heart of God is for human beings at all times. I'm sorry, but where in the Bible does it explain that this was the best God could have done at the time? It doesn't. You're just filling in the gaps with your own human reason. And finally, on the topic of why animals and plants seem to be related to each other in such a way that suggests common ancestry, Christians will argue that God is, and I quote, thrifty. You know, people will say, well, evolution is backed by the, the sheer DNA of chimpanzees and mice and such. And we see common building blocks. Sure. We see common building blocks within the human body and the earth. Both contain carbon, both contain, you know, myriads of different compounds and chemicals that, you know, are, are, are prevalent in both. It seems to me that it would make sense that if our Heavenly Father was going to create life, he would use some of the same genetic code when they're doing the exact same thing. That would be evidence to me of a thrifty, wise creator. Fun fact, the word thrifty appears precisely zero times in the Bible. It seems to me that when Christians think they have a good defense of God's nature or actions in light of the world around us, even if it's not actually stated in the Bible, they'll argue for it. But when they don't have a good defense of God's nature or actions, again in light of something about the world, such as when discussing the problem of evil, divine hiddenness, or why God would send bears to maul children, they'll just fall back on the answer that, well, God must have some unknown, mysterious reason, and they will then accuse atheists of daring to make inferences about such an incomprehensible being, even though in many cases it seems that they themselves were willing to do exactly the same thing had it led to a nice conclusion. In my experience, many Christians are perfectly happy to put God in a petri dish when they think they can extract an answer that paints God in a good light, or at least an answer that seems reasonably plausible by our human standards. But when a plausible answer that feels good and kind of paints God in a good light isn't forthcoming, they may just declare that the entire investigation was futile and insulting to begin with. How can you possibly pretend to know what God is thinking? The hubris of man truly knows no bounds. When this happens, it really just comes across as a case of sour grapes. They lose the game, so they declare that the entire game was stupid to begin with. In fact, if God really is incomprehensible, then why not simply respond to every argument against God by appealing to his incomprehensible nature, or his incomprehensible reasons? I mean, do you not have faith that it all makes sense under the hood? Why would you even attempt to use your limited human reasoning to try and defend God and his religion? God wrote laws about how to practice slavery instead of abolishing it altogether? Well, he must have had some good mysterious reason, right? I mean, who am I to even venture a guess at what that reason might be? So, 
could God have some mysterious, unknowable reasons for, for instance, allowing suffering, or for creating us, or for not making himself readily known to us? Technically, yes. The mysterious reasons answer does solve these problems. But if you give this answer, you not only make God an unfalsifiable claim, but you effectively forfeit your right to analyze God's nature and make inferences about God's intentions, even if you're doing so in his defense. And, as a bonus, it kind of makes it look like you really don't trust God in the way you claim to when using this defense.